what that means. No one knows what it means, but it's provocative. No, it's not. It's it gets gross. the people it's going. Well, Hector, here's the game plan. You're gonna bring us two absolute martinis. You know how I like them, straight up. And then precisely seven and one half minutes after that, you're gonna bring us two more. And then two more after that every five minutes until one of us passes the fuck out. You got a bad attitude and you don't listen. Oh yes. There will be blood. It is not the violence that sets men apart. All right, it is the distance that he is prepared to go. Ever notice how you come across somebody once in a while that you shouldn't have fucked with? That's me. What the fuck else would you do this job? Cocaine and hookers, my friend. Welcome to the Max Ordnance Podcast. Max Ordnate Nation, what is up? Jeff, you were just talking. You had this awesome speech going. And I remind I you that we have about 15 minutes of us talking Ugh. that are not going to make it in the show. So now, now you can you can say your piece about how difficult it has been to get heavy duty it is. dirt workers. To come to the desert to move dirt. And they don't even have to take the dirt out. We want to keep them. No, it is. No, it's insane. So like I was just saying, for those that don't know or haven't been out to the range, uh, we have a slight elevation pitch we need to kind of get squared away at our 100-yard line. Um, And we've been trying for, what, six months, a year to get someone to do grade work out there to come just take it from six foot to zero over 100 yards. It's not that much work. I don't want to exaggerate it. I don't know if I've been like whatever it it could be three feet like who knows but the point is to get someone to come out and actually give us a quote just to i could have bought a d8 ran it and then returned it for for less money and still and made that difference up in the time it's taken these people to come out and give us give us quotes to get this we've had let's see we had the excavator come out and we did some movement and then we had a second individual come out with a D6. This thing was massive. Whatever yeah. it was, it was a dozer, but it couldn't punch through some of the rock out there. So it was kind of just moving dirt around, but it didn't really accomplish what we wanted. No, you need both. You need an excavator and like a D8 out there. It's going to take two pieces of machinery. I mean, honestly, we should probably just run it to ourselves. But when do we have time, right? When do we have three days to, to do nothing to go out there and do it ourselves? So I'm, uh, I'm all about doing it myself. Yeah. I know how to run the dozer. I know how to run the bucket loaders. But the issue is, I just want to throw this out there to you, is uh, we need a pretty, we need a hefty excavator, right? And mm-hmm. um, I rented a small excavator when we were flattening out that moving platform for the moving target. Yes. So I went to Home Depot and I bought one of their small excavators. And I'm like, I can figure this the fuck out because I'm smart dude. Mm -hmm. And I have experience with machinery like this. So I'm out there and let's just say that it, I wasn't a smooth operator. All right. (laughs) I was like trying to get the bucket to do shit. I'm like, how do I get, yeah, oh, son of a bit, like just the, you know, it's not just operating the machine, but it's knowing where to put the machine and how you're going. There's a, there's a finesse to it. That's for, that's why those guys get paid the big bucks. Guys, so if anybody wants to come out and help us move some dirt out in the desert, send us a message, <laughs> drop us a message in, in our DMs and, and tell us you want to come out and help. Cause so we've had been a nightmare. people come out for quotes right to look at the property and tell us how much it would cost and how many days we're looking at to get the things done that we want and so far we are two for two of people coming out and not sending us the quotes that we've asked for it's like are they afraid of the property or is it the generation of today 
of not wanting to do work that is harder than normal. What do you think it is? I don't know, man. Like it, it is, it, it's, there's drive time involved to get out there, but most of these guys given quotes should be relatively local. So honestly, I don't know. I don't know why it's hard to get guys to come out. Uh, you know, it's hard for me to get guys to come out and give me a quote on work and I'm in the middle of, of the city. So yeah, I think contractors are the, I mean, there's a, there's a statistic I saw for like every seven contractor that, or, or construction worker or trade worker that leaves, um, only one person's replacing them at, at this generation. So the average age used to be 30, like the average age, I think is 42 now. And so there's just less and less guys doing the work. Um, wow. and it, it could be generational, but, um, fuck dude, just come out and move some dirt. Yeah. I mean, the last, I think, what was it? The first or the second guy who came out to quote, like I even talked about, like, I will get you a hotel at, you know, Victor Bill's nicest fucking place. Like, oh yeah. We'll stay at the Marriott or we'll stay at the Holiday Inn. But either way, like your guy will be taken care of. I just need somebody out here to move some dirt, send me a price so I can at least decide if we can afford it right now. You yeah, know, for sure. Shit, man. Right now, I don't know if it's gonna cost us 10 G's or a hundred because we don't have any pricing fair enough but we'll get it done man we'll get it done it'll be nice it'll be what we want maybe this is just a blessing in disguise where we didn't want those people anyway you are not wrong so anyways a couple things today and we're either going to do two episodes that are slightly short or we're going to do one episode that's slightly longer either way we're going to get this shit hashed out, but a few things. First, I want to talk about building a rifle because I put a video out there on social media maybe a week ago, week and a half ago, and it was me just working with Miranda to get her rifle set up, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we went through the whole spiel of like what we're trying to do and I don't think in the video I was able to talk about why we do these things. Like, you know, we talk about length of pull. And one of the things that I see very common, right, is either one, the manufacturer is building a fixed length of pull or the shortest configuration of that length of pull is somewhere around 12 and a half to 13 inches. And then you'll see like, are you familiar with the Jay Allen chassis? I am. I had one for my M1 years ago. All right. So the Jay Allen, I had one for a bolt gun. Um, they were going out of business. Then they got purchased by MDT. And now MDT is slowly producing their chassis again. Right. So the thing about this, uh, j allen chassis is at the length of pull and its shortest configuration it had adjustable length of pull but its shortest configuration was 13 inches which is extremely long for me it's about an inch and an inch and a quarter inch and a half too long i have a short length of pull i got like a t-rex arms and shit right now i know everybody's anatomy is different but if you look at the average person right if you take a hundred people i bet you the average length of pull would be somewhere between 12 and 12 and a half inches, right? Yep. So if you're buying one of these factory stocks or chassis that has a length of pull that is too long from the beginning, right? And then you start adding spacers to it, you're just, you're adding to the problem. And I feel like people are building rifles to fit their comfort level instead of fitting how they're going to be shooting. Does that make sense? It does. One of the things, um, you know, early when I had that Jay Allen, it was before the 700 came out, right? So we're talking 1998, maybe 99, um, maybe a little later, um, or maybe it wasn't that late. Maybe it was mid 2000s. Anyhow, um, and I had, I had configured the rifle with that chassis and immediately was like, oh, this is a little stiff. It fits okay, but it kind of, it's it's got, you know, a pretty hard plastic, whatever. So I added spacers and I added a big rubber uh, 
uh, buttstock. And I was like, oh, this is really comfortable. Adding almost two full inches to the length of pull of that. Um, you know, if I went and measured it now, I bet it was 14 and a half by the time it was all stacked and done. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and I set it up for my comfort level. Um, yeah. not, not knowing at the time that, that, you know, it, it mattered obviously. So never shot it. Well, it wasn't, didn't handle great. And, and just that little bit of, uh, adding that buttstock on it, those, those spacers, it was, was probably all the difference to make it not fit me. Yeah. So with that being said, like, cause I owned a Jay Allen, I was added to the Jay Allen Facebook page and it's still active and around today. Um, and a feed popped up the other day and I was like looking at it and I, you know, click on it and, you know, this guy's talking about like, I wish MDT would make spacers that are cheaper, more affordable because I'm having to go out and make my own fucking spacers just to keep the cost down, which if you think about it, I don't know how much these spacers cost, but if you have to go out and get custom spacers made and that's cheaper than buying spacers from a manufacturing company. That's ridiculous, right? But it's not yeah, for sure. So this guy's talking about like adding two or three spacers and extending his length to pull by roughly an inch. And I'm like, holy shit. Like, who is this guy? Are his, you know, knuckles past his knees? How long is his length to pull to have his rifle set up that way? And, you know, the the crazy part about it is that by having an action with a Picatinny rail on top, you can adjust your scope, right? So you can set your length to pull up. You could say, you know what? This feels really comfortable for me. And then you can mount your scope closer to your face. You can move it on the rail. You can do all of these things to accommodate the error that you have just introduced into the system, right? And I think that's, an area that we need to discuss is is what is the length of pull for like maybe that's where the disconnect is is people are building the rifle based off what they think or feel is good but they're not understanding the purpose behind why do i need my length of pull to match the basically the inside crack of your arm to a 90 degree trigger finger why do i need that so i feel like that's what we're going to talk about today is is building the rifle out and it always starts with length of pull and then we get to buttstock positioning and then we get to mounting the scope right and then we can get to the cheek piece but that's the order of operations is length of pull buttstock placement and then mounting scope and then cheek piece and now you're you're set for everything else right so with the length of pull we're looking at a elbow to trigger finger, proper trigger finger, right? 90 degrees. And what do you think the reason behind that is? Like, I know that's so, some people, a lot of people use that. Some people don't care. And there is a method. There's a reason that we, that we focus on this and it's kind of twofold. So what do you think? Yeah. So I would think. And my reasoning has always been that you have an ideal, um, I don't want to say elbow angle, but you have an ideal, you know, 90 in your elbow for when you're shooting prone or in any other, say your elbow out support position that could be right or wrong. But I do know that when my length of pull is too long, it puts me at a uh, mechanical leverage disadvantage for my arm being out here um, to be able to support, I guess, my elbow to the ground. Okay. But, so taking what you just said, right, I got my left hand here. So let's imagine that I'm a left-handed shooter. I got a left-handed bolt. When I plant my elbow here and my hands on the, you know, the grip and the trigger, mm -hmm. if my length of pull is too long, then when I go to rack the bolt, what's going to happen? My elbow is going to break contact with the ground, grab the bolt, cycle, come back down, and now I have to re-establish that bone support right yep if my length of pull is set correctly then i should be able to manipulate the bolt without the elbow ever leaving the ground right and this is strictly just talking about prone position right. so 
my length of pull will directly affect my ability to maintain bone support or cause me to have to break it. That's right there. That should be the first reason that you look at bone support and look at your length of pull and say, how are they connected? And why is length of pull so important to me? So that's your first one right there. And I've got some older videos. There was a video I used to show in the classes where I was shooting the Jay Allen and I could shoot just fine, right? Like, obviously, I'm not going to show a video where I'm sucking, but the video I show is me cleaning a stage. But the whole point of me showing this video is that every time I go to rack the bolt, my elbow has to come completely off the ground, cycle the bolt, and then reestablish my position. Now, one, if I get really good at this, I'm going to be consistent. So I'll be able to get that elbow back into the place that it needs to be, right? But what am I giving up on top of breaking my position every time? Well, I'm giving up time, right? Because now I have to settle that elbow back into the same spot. And if it's not there, I'm either fighting the rifle or I've got to take the time to settle back down and reestablish. So time is the ultimate factor here, right? Losing time. So outside of the prone position, where else do you see length of pull kind of coming into play and having a negative effect on the shooter? You got you got another open your brain for a second and come up off the ground. So, you know, one of the things that um, I would say a lot of people would struggle with, including myself, if I think about a, a, a rifle that has a length of pull that's too long, I would think of any position where I need my support arm um, or I need my body position where I have to contact maybe the front of the rifle where I need to, I need that length to reach out. So barricaded tripod, um, if that's too long, then I can't stay behind the rifle. I have to actually blade myself to either reach, grab the barricade, do whatever I need for here um, with my left arm. Um, I think a good example would be me and you shoot the same way with tripods where I'm thumb down on the front, on the rear leg. Well, I would have to almost put my body this way in order to uh, maintain contact with the butt pad and keep my arm on the tripod. Absolutely. That's exactly what it is, is. There's a limiting factor, a limiting feature on your stocks and your chassis, and that feature is the magazine, right? So if you have an extraordinarily long length of pull, what it's doing is driving your body further away from the barricade. And the magazine is only going to allow you to go so far forward. So you can throw your bag up there, you can put your rifle up, and you can push that rifle as far forward as you want to. But the magazine is only going to allow you to get so far. So if the magazine is a limiting feature, and just like you said, my non-firing hand, my length of pull is too long for me to reach up front, maybe get an elbow or a forearm contact and barricade. Now my body has to twist and rotate. Now I'm fucking with recoil management. And now I've introduced other problems, right? And same thing goes for the tripod. Like you're just you're starting to compound issues. It's almost like tolerance stacking, you know? Yeah, like, for sure. I, it, I would, I think, so maybe an extreme example of this would be, remember I was telling you about, um, Connor's got this savage tactical rifle that he has built and it's a, it's a sack, but it's, it's the rifle that he's got. And the offset, scope mount we actually had to flip around backwards because the length of pull on that stock factory savage stock is so long that the offset mount is actually flipped backwards to bring the optic closer to his face well yeah. the length of pull is so long that on a tripod or even even prone i can't reach the magazine to to do a mag change without breaking my position because the length of pull is so long no, that makes 100% sense right there is what you're talking about. Like I've had students in class where the fixed length of length of pull is so long that for them to get the buttstock in the right position and have the right eye relief, we had to flip their scope mount around, right? Maybe they have a, um, 
an offset, you know, scope mount or something, whatever the gun store sold them. And it's like, okay, mm-hmm. you know, we're going to have to do some janky shit here, but <clears throat> this is where we're at right now. Like, this is how we have to accomplish this task. But there was one thing that you said, which I couldn't stop thinking about because it sounded like a mouthful, which was the Savage Stock Factory <laughs> Stock. Stock, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right. Uh, oh, bit- before we get, well, before we switch from Jay Allen. So this is a little bit of a trivia. Who was one of their first celebrity endorsements for their stocks? The reason I bought that that rifle stock. Dude, I, I didn't even know about Jay Allen until like 2014. Lou Ferrigno. Really? Uh-huh. Dude, the Hulk himself. Yeah, the early years was just him walking around SHOT Show. It was just him and the JAE. Dude, that's legit, man. Yeah. That's legit. All right, so length of pull, huge factor in terms of setting up your rifle and either helping you or hurting you throughout your different positions. And the reason that it's important is we talk about consistency all the time. Well, consistency is more than just I'm pressing the trigger the same way every time or I'm firing on the exhale every single time. Consistency is also your positioning from prone to tripod to barricade or or alternate position. Like you want your position to be as consistent as possible as well. So your length of pool is going to assist you with that or you're going to be putting yourself at a disadvantage, right? The next part is going to be buttstock placement, right? And the reason that we go into buttstock placement after length of pull is because, Jeff, there's so many people out there that I will watch their videos, right? And I'm like, because this is my life, right? This is, I I live, eat, and breathe precision rifle shooting, right? It's like, I know that all my friends say I don't have a real job because I do something fun for a living, but like, this is all I do. And it's kind of like, you know, take whatever career that you've had, like right now you're a business owner. Okay. But you know, back when you were building cars and making sick ass hot rods, if you watch one of those shows on Netflix, you're probably critiquing the fuck out of all of the things that they're doing like oh they shouldn't do that this way or they you know the the suspension they put on there is janky as shit like because you have that experience in that background like you can see things that other people don't see right so it's kind of the same thing where i see these videos and i start to nitpick i start to look at little things here and there and one of the things is people throw the butt sock in their collarbone and then they'll start to lower their body, but then they'll drop the butt stock down onto like their upper chest. And you just negated everything that you've done, right? Why don't you lift the bipods up and extend your bipods so that you can keep that butt stock placement, right? So the first thing that we'll do is getting the right position. You have the shooter lay down directly behind the rifle and they don't even have the rifle in their shoulder. Like the the rifle is not important right now. What is important is getting the shooter into a comfortable position. So I will have them lay down in the prone and basically say, remember when you were a kid, you used to lay on the floor in front of the fucking tube television, right? And you just hold your fucking head up and watch this. Exactly, right? So I want you to get your elbows in a nice comfortable spot. I want you to put your hands under your head. And now you're in the position that you feel most comfortable. Now we're going to build the rifle to fit that height, right? So we extend the bipods. We get the rifle at the right height. Now, because they're in a comfortable position, their head's more upright. They're not cranking their neck. They're not complaining about neck pain later. Now we can get that collarbone engaged with the butt pad. So I tell students, I'm always looking for an indicator, something that feels like I'm in the right position. So I grab the rifle and I drive it up high and I feel it along my jaw and my cheek and I'll set it down on the collarbone because what I'm looking for is the connection between the shooter and the butt pad is where all your recoil is flowing through. So if the position of the butt pad is off to the right or off to the left or too low or too high, you're going to see that in the reticle. 
right? Your recoil, boom, is going to go in the path of least resistance. So I'm always looking for when I place the buttstock directly below my jaw, right on the collarbone, center of the pad, what does my face feel? So for me, I bring the rifle up and I set it down and I feel the cheek piece right there on my jaw. So then all I have to do is drop my head and I'm looking through the scope. So that's the second part of this equation is being able to get them into a comfortable position by elbows on the ground, hold your head up. Okay, this is where I'm comfortable. Now I can introduce the rifle after I've set up the bipods for the right height, right? But what I don't want to see is the bipods are collapsed to their lowest position. We've got, you know, the Harris fucking swivel bipods that are six to nine inches. Mm -hmm. You've got in the six inch configuration and you are fighting to get your body down low enough to see through the rifle. Like that's not it, you know? So if you think about when you're, you know, just the thickness of your body, normal, normal people, like, do you think I'm normal? Do you think my body... So, I mean, prop, I mean, we normal for somebody else. Okay, so we can use you as an example. I may be short, but I'm thick, baby. Like T H I C C thick. Okay, mm -hmm. so when I lay, wait, if I turn sideways, you see in the camera here, from chest to back, I'm twelve inches thick, right? Roughly. Okay, so if the rifle bipods are set at six inches. Where's that putting the center of my butt pad? Halfway between your body. Okay. But I actually need, if my, if my body is more upright to give me better recoil management and better connection with the stock and mm -hmm. a more comfortable position, then my chest is actually kind of elevated almost up off the ground. Yeah. So if I got six inch bipods, then I'm fighting to get flat enough. So it's not helping me in the long run to fight against the rifle. I want to be comfortable. I want to be able to stay in that position and I want the recoil management and it's going to feel weird right now. I'm not saying that you got, you know, 12, 13 inches up off the ground. What I am saying is that don't be afraid to extend your bipods to get the rifle in the right position, but there is a thing as too low and there is a thing as too high, right? So we want to find that middle ground. And this is all just basic rifle setup. Obviously, the range is going to dictate how you set your position up. Like, you know, we talked about in the beginning of this episode that our 100-yard range has a slight uphill. Mm -hmm. It's uh, it, If we're being honest, I think it's approximately from firing line to target line, it's three and a half feet. Okay. So if you set your bipods to the lowest configuration – you're going to really struggle to aim up three and a half feet at a hundred yards. Oh right? yeah, for sure. And, and somebody like me, you know, my, my indicator is pretty, pretty evident when, when I have something set up too low, or if I'm, if my rifle is too low in my, in my, it's off of my collarbone, because, you know, with my neck issues and the surgeries and the fusion I have, I'm either in a good position or I can't shoot. So there's no in between. Mm -hmm. Um, so for me, it's kind of easy. My my neck either hurts or I'm in a good position. Um, it's it's self-correcting. <laughs> yeah. So that's the thing, Jeff, is like knowing, am I in a good position, right? And for you, it's, it's a pain indicator, right? And it could be mm -hmm. the same for other people as well. But once you put that buttstock where it's supposed to be and you start widening your elbows, to change your elevation, right? There's going to be a point where you can't get any lower. And then that's where the mistakes start to happen is yep. you got buttstock here, guys or gals, whoever start to widen their elbows. They can't quite get to the target. So they start letting the butt pad drop off their collarbone and more onto their chest. And now you've changed all kinds of shit. You've changed how the, your body's going to manage recoil. You've changed the distance from your eye to the ocular lens. So now your eye relief is all jacked up. Like everything has changed and you're not consistent with the position that you should be for everywhere, right? For your barricades, for your tripods, that's going back to consistency, right? Consistency in your position. So work with the bipods, 
set yourself up so that you have a good position, all right? And then don't allow yourself to break out of that position. If something needs to change, then change it on the rifle. Don't change it on your contact with the gun. So Correct. we've only gone through two steps so far. We've talked about length of pull, and we've talked about getting the butt pad in the correct position. We haven't even mounted the fucking scope yet, right? And the reason that this comes second is because we want the shooter, or sorry, third, we want the shooters to know what a good position is supposed to feel like and look like. Then we can mount the scope, right? Because like I said, if the butt pad is too low, then that drives your face farther forward. So we see this often too, like law enforcement snipers will show up. Their rifles are already built because they've been in a team for how long? Mm Mm-hmm. It's like, all right, I'm going to show you what the real position looks like. And then we get them in the real position, crank their scope up to max power. It's like, can you see through the scope? They're like, I can, but I have scope shadow over it. Yeah, no shit, because you had set your rifle up incorrectly, and now your face is too far away from the scope, right? So now we can mount our scope, max power, so that your exit pupil is as small as it can be. And if you can see full field of view, clear sight picture everything through the scope now you have the correct eye relief right and that should also be an indicator jeff of when you get into a shooting position if you can't get the proper eye relief with all the other things being correct then you need to change positions you need to try something else right because if you can't get the right eye relief you shouldn't be changing the button but stock location you shouldn't be changing your position drastically just to accommodate that you can't see through the scope you got to do something different or you're going to just start compounding those issues all over again right yeah and an indicator i've seen and it's sort of just a tell for me is when i watch students you know set up behind their rifles and you watch them switch out rear bags three or four times because they can't get that rear bag to quite work and it's such a a tell that their their rifle is just not set up right yeah yeah 100 <clears throat> percent. so step four you know phase four of this whole process of you know getting your rifle set up the right way is you set the check the cheek piece last right and there's been multiple times where you know I preach all the time, Jeff, like, excuse me, you need a one mil recoil bubble, right? So you shoot and from your aiming point, did the reticle move less than one mil from where you were aiming, right? Like after recoil, everything settles back down. Do you still see the target and is the target within one mil, right? Well, a lot of the times, like take, for instance, the right, right right-handed shooter, their cheek is here. Okay. And you can tell a lot by like, do they have the right buttstock position by how high their cheek piece is set up, right? If you have your buttstock high up on that collarbone, you don't need a lot of cheek piece, right? And the cheek piece, it's only supposed to do a couple things. One, it's an indicator to help you consistently get behind the rifle the same way every time. And two, it allows your neck to get some tension relief by supporting your face. But if you're having to press into the gun or if you've got a weird position happening, then I've seen it where right-handed shooter, they got their face on the gun, boom, they shoot. And they're like, "Uh, Tyler, I'm like 20 mils left. And it's like, okay, why? Why are we 20 mils left? So we play with it. We adjust the buttstock position and we can just go step by step. It's kind of like working on a car where if something's, you know, broke or it's not working properly, you got to go step by step to kind of figure out what that problem is. So a lot of times we'll come across students who are applying pressure with their face. So when they shoot, their face is pressing the buttstock right, which is causing the muzzle to go left. Perfect. So let's work on your position. Let's work on your rifle setup, right? And there was a, I'm trying to think here. Maybe there wasn't a time. I don't know if there was ever a time where I didn't value rifle setup, but there was definitely a time where I had almost like an epiphany where I valued setting up the rifle so much. And I still do to this day, especially with new shooters, but even advanced shooters. 
like making sure that the rifle's set up properly. It's important that we take, you know, the two hours to set it up the right way in the beginning so that we're not fighting with problems on <clears throat> two or day three. You know what I'm saying? Because that's yep. the annoying shit is like, okay, you didn't do what you were supposed to do. You didn't understand the assignment. And now we have to stop and rewind and fix these problems all over again, right? So now you come to a PR1 course and, you know, we go through the classroom portion. We talk about fundamentals. We do all this stuff. And then there's an hour and a half block set aside so that we can get every single student set up correctly with length of pull, buttstock position, eye relief, scope mounting, all of it. And then we're set up for success for the rest of the two and a half days. You know what I'm saying? Yep. I, so, I think, you know, people showing up with, with rifles that just aren't set up properly is, <clears throat> is always going to be a problem. But I think until, you know, I think the problem is, is how do you, are, are, do people sometimes show up with rifles that are so far out of spec that it's, I don't say it's, it's unusable, but, um, you know, it's, it's almost, it's so detrimental for them that they can't set it up to take the class properly. I mean, is that something that, that happens that we just have to, we have to fix their gear? On the <laughs> I mean, fly? Like, um, you know, I, I brought this out because here's a, for instance, right. This is, this is my, my air rifle, but, um, I set this up ready to go shoot. I was going to go out to the desert last week. Um, it's ready to go. And, and I just mounted a set of rings on it. If you just look at that, it works great. Um, I ripped my thermal off, so I, I put a, a different set of rings on here. This rifle is unusable. Yeah. I cannot physically look through that that glass because yeah. my cheap bones are are low and prominent. So as a student, if I were to show up with something like that, I wouldn't even be able to take the class and run any rounds through it to set my rifle up right because I would have to be like this the entire class. So you know, what would you say to, to people like putting rifles together that are, I mean, is there anything online? Is there something that we can send them or show them that, because people are just going to go buy rings, buy chassis and set, and set yeah. their rifles up and then try to go to class. And then we got to unfuck them when they get there. I don't know if there is anything necessarily online that I would trust right now. I would say that, you know, there's some <clears throat> books out there like, you know, a lot of people have hit me up and, and talked about Ryan Kleckner's, um, you know, mm -hmm. Fundamentals of Marksmanship book. And I haven't personally read it from cover to cover, but I, I did purchase it and I kind of flipped through it to see, you know, because I get a lot of comparisons to what I teach to what he teaches. So I'm like, well, who is this guy? And let me figure out what the hell he's talking about. Um, so I'd say he's got a pretty good book. And you could start there, but at the same time, like we're not us personally, we're not unavailable, right? Maybe busy, maybe, maybe take me, you know, a week to respond to your direct message or your email. Um, you know, but if you're part of the Patreon group, like I check that thing daily to see if, you know, anybody's message, if they need anything, like, you know, if they got questions, if there's a video that we posted up and they need help, like, you know, so that would be an option uh, if you want to directly message us. But I think I think that's a good a good resource, right? Going to the Patreon, it's super cheap and just having access to to pick your brain for setting rifles up. Right. Like the amount of money you can waste buying two hundred fifty three dollars sets of rings buying chassis that don't fit like you can waste a lot of money fast oh yeah and it's gear that just doesn't work for you you know and we've had students sign up for pr1 and then they message and say what do i need for this class like what should i buy and it's like don't buy anything why don't you come to the class and whatever you need you tell me ahead of time and i will get it and then you can try certain things you can try this bag you can try this bag you can try this scope you can try whatever the fuck if i have it you can try it and then you can make an informed decision after you've been educated but don't mm -hmm. go buy something until you know what you want right and we had a student that 
that said, should I go with a stock or a chassis? I'm like, I don't, have you shot either one of them? Well, no, I'm new to the, I'm new to shooting. It's like, okay, so you don't know what you like. Why don't you come out here? You're talking about getting a private training session. Why don't you just come out and shoot our stock rifle, shoot our chassis rifle and kind of see what you like. I can tell you what the benefits of each one are, but you don't know what you're going to like until you try it. And what I hate for you to do is buy something, find out that you don't like it or it's not what you want. And now you're the next person on sniper side trying to get rid of your shit, you know, like there's options out there. And And, I mean, and that's a good point. I mean, we've literally built rifles for people to, not that we just, Hey, we have one, like here's a loaner, use it. Like literally built rifles for people to make sure they had one for classes. So um, that's a good point to make nine times out of 10. That's what it is. Yeah. Because like, we have so many different options and so many different configurations. It's like, all right, you're coming to the class and you want to borrow a rifle. I'm all for it. Let's talk about what caliber do you think that you want to go with? Let me give you a quick rundown of what the benefits of each caliber are. All right. Now we're going to set you up with this chassis. We'll build the chassis when you're here, but let's talk about optics. I have all of these different loophole configurations this is my reticle selection. I know you don't know shit about a reticle right now, but let's give you the basic rundown, you know? And like, when I say a basic rundown, it's like, this is just happening over text message. Like, hey, a Tremor 3 will allow you to hold for wind, but you can't dial the scope or the wind dots don't mean anything. Or we can go this route. Or do you like more simplistic stuff? Maybe a PR2 reticle is better for you. How about I just bring them all out and- Exactly. Through them all. And then we'll go from there, right? But a lot of rifles that we put together for students to loan out are custom built right yeah. in the garage just so we can set them up with something that we think they'll like and then we can build from there. But uh, yeah, I hate I hate seeing people waste money and then you know not be happy with whatever it is that they have. To answer your question, there's definitely, I could think of like three off the top of my head who... Purchase the rifle, whether it was a factory production rifle or it was a custom gun off sniper side, whatever it was. But they've showed up with things that I just can't fix. Like, I do remember a specific instance where, you know, we try to get the guy in the right position. He's directly behind his rifle. He's got the buttstock nice and high. The length of pull is, is collapsed as low as it will go. And, you know... We had to basically take his scope mount, which was uh, an offset mount, right? It's a forward mm-hmm. offset mount. We got lucky because <clears throat> the offset mount was not an MOA bias. MOA offset. But it was just flat. And it's like, all right, we could work with this. It's going to look stupid. You're going to post shit up on social media and people might make fun of you. But this is our solution right now. So we turn his scope around or we turn his <laughs> his rings around and now his offset mount is is reverse right and it's like that's what we got and then you know another student who's just got a scope with rings on top and you know no matter what we do we can't get the scope close enough to his face because his rifle stock doesn't fit his body so now we're playing the uh i can't help you fix your gear so we're going to have to modify your position to try and still be fundamentally sound while also allowing you to shoot but just know you have a problem and there's nothing i can do about it right now you know like and it sucks i i've been in a situation like that where i'm like i can't fix this like there's nothing i can do but i can loan you this chassis we can build you a rifle right here right now at the range and you know I understand students come to the course and there's multiple objectives, right? One objective is student wants to learn how to fucking shoot long range. He wants to learn the fundamentals. He wants to learn all of these intricacies and the theory behind long range shooting. And I get that. The other side of that is we take a lot of pride, Jeff, and show up with what you have 
and we will do our best to make sure you learn how to use it, right? And I'd say 90%, 95% of the time, that works, right? Even if your gun shoots two in the way, we're gonna make we're gonna make do with what we got, right? Uh, but then sometimes it's better to pick and choose what your values are. You know, do you want to learn how to be the best with the gear that you have, or do you want to focus on building your capabilities? And you're going to switch that rifle out later. So let's give you something else to use, right? So it's it's important just to understand the shooter and what their objectives are. And it, it will also help guide how they can go through the course and, and how we can help them, you know? No, that's good info. I, I mean, I can't, I guess I can't just, I can't plug that Patreon hard enough. I mean, you can get all this information, just that's the easiest way to do it without wasting a bunch of money. Yeah. Uh, you know, I got a guy right now, uh, he is a Patreon member but he's messaging me privately and I'm happy to help him. So he sent me a video. He's like, tell me what I'm doing wrong. And I'm like, okay. So I'm like watching his video and you know, every time I watch a video, I got to watch something different, right? Because it's not enough for me to see a mistake and then say, Oh, there's one. Oh, there's another. Oh, there's another. I want to see if it's consistent or if it was a one-time thing, because now it's generating questions for me to ask him like, Hey buddy, I'm watching your video and I watched it, you know, half dozen times. And what I'm noticing is that every position, there's two targets that you're shooting at. You go to a first position, you got target one, target two, second position, target one, target two. What I'm noticing is every time you go to aim at target number two, your body's not moving. Your shoulders are moving. So is that affecting your natural point of aim? Are you noticing a difference in your recoil? from target one to target two, because that's the first thing I'm picking out. The second thing I'm picking out is that you seem to be fidgeting or adjusting the rifle once you're looking through the scope, because I'm watching you just throw your bag down on this rock and then plop your rifle on it. Maybe try being a little more deliberate with placing your bag and setting your rifle there, and then you won't have to fidget so much once you're behind the gun, because the gun will be set up the way that you want it from the beginning. And this is a hard one for people to kind of get in tune with, Jeff, is deliberate placement of your bag and rifle because it feels like you're moving so slow. But ultimately, you might be moving a little slower by deliberately placing your bag and your rifle, but then you're not having to fidget or play around with your position once you're down in it. Everything's set up the way that you want it already, you know? So like... You got to let go of the feelings and say, if I do this intentionally, then everything's done. But if I just plop rifle, plop bag, and now I'm behind it, now I got to fix shit on the fly, right? And you're burning time. So, uh, but that's uh, just one example. And, you know, he, he said he's got a match today that he's going to go to. So I'm looking for more videos that he's going to send me so I can hopefully critique him and, and help him out a little bit more. But uh, yeah, man, so the Patreon is definitely a good outlet and I'm trying to get it set up so that we can have more of a group think tank so somebody can message in and, you know, it's, I think it's hard for egos to be put aside a little bit. Does that make sense? Like, oh, it, it's all, it always is. They're, that's, like, that's why they're called egos. I mean, if you message in and you're like, I'm going <clears> to <throat> Tyler a message, but I'm going to set it to private because I don't want to be embarrassed in front of anybody else. And it's like, all right, I understand that. But at the same time, like, I want to get us into a space where we can speak freely because if you're having this problem, then somebody else might be having this problem mm -hmm. and we can learn from each other. And that's another, you know, that's another point right there, Jeff, is like we, in the summertime, we primarily focus on private courses, right? One-on-one -on -one teaching and, you know, a guy just messaged into the website and said, hey, you messaged me and said that you're putting up another PR1 in September and November. So now we're going to have three PR1s in the fall because it's, I'm getting so many messages about it. I'm like, all right, yes, I'm going to add more courses. My bad. And he says, do you recommend coming to a group class or private instruction? 
and his kind of his reference was I'm in, you know, jujitsu and I've noticed that I'm getting a lot better with private instruction than I am with group instruction. So you can chime in and throw your opinion down, but my opinion is both sides have their, their benefits, right? Like private instruction, all the focus is on you as an individual, right? But we're going to go through our curriculum. We're going to set you up. We're going to answer all your questions. We're going to be one-on-one -on -one with you the whole time, right? But that doesn't mean that every question or like, it doesn't mean that you're going to ask every question that is out there. Whereas if you're in group training, now you have the opportunity to learn from other people's mistakes and questions and shit like that, right? So group training, you're not getting the personalization, but you're also getting the, you're learning from everybody around you, right? So I feel like yeah. both sides have their place. <clears throat> uh, one of the things that one of the guys that I used to take classes from, um, supermoto classes right it's socal supermoto this guy brian um they run he runs group classes in i think it's riverside somewhere it's not too far from here um but i had messaged into him a long time ago when we first met and i was like hey um you know long time motorcycle rider used to race a lot like i have experience but would you recommend i come and take a, a private course with you um or should i just drop into a, a group course and his, his answer was pretty simple. He's like, well, you don't even know if you're going to fucking like me or not. Why do you yeah. want to spend all the extra money in a, in a private lesson when you're going to learn just as much in a group setting and get to meet all these other people too? And then if you like it, cool, come to a, come to a private lesson. So I've, in all the classes that I've held myself, I've sort of had that same mentality where it's like, these people may not even like us. Like, come see me first, like in a group setting, come hang out. Don't Don't just show up you know, by yourself in a, in a private lesson, because I, I feel like not necessarily monetary, mon monetary, monetarily. Yeah. Not that it's a waste of money, but I think you get from an initial meeting an initial class, I think you get a lot more value out of a group setting first. There's other people that are going to ask questions that either you may not have thought to ask, but maybe you're just too, fr too afraid to ask because maybe you think it's a stupid question and somebody's going to raise their hand and you're going to go, Oh fuck. I'm glad somebody asked that. So yeah. I would always say go for group classes first, no matter what. Yeah. I mean, group classes are great. I didn't even think about, like, Hey, you may, maybe you won't like me. Like I'm almost banking on the fact that for sure, you know, 50% of the people I meet will probably not like me because I am too, too forward with you're a lot. You're what you're I a lot. think. Like if you're sucking, I have no issues telling you that you're sucking and we need to fix the problem. Right. And if you're not listening or if you're not applying the, you know, it's kind of like the three strikes rule. It's like, okay, we're going to do this. And I explain it. We talk about why we're doing it, blah, 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 blah. And then we get to the point where he's supposed to do it and he doesn't do it. It's like, okay, remember we talked about doing this. Now let's try it again. You know, it doesn't happen third time. Okay. Let's try to wrap our brains around this a different way. Let's approach it from a different angle. Let's make sure you're understanding it. You know, and then the third or fourth time, it's like, okay, I'm not mad at you, but I'm not seeing a conscious, a conscious effort of you trying to apply what it is that we're talking about. So talk to me and tell me why you're not doing this. Are you just telling me to fuck off? Or is there another issue that I'm not seeing that we need to tackle first? Right. But I have that personality of like, you're in my, you're in my world. Yeah. But that same guy may take more, may get more value because if he goes to a group class and the focus isn't all on him. So, yeah. okay. He didn't really learn that part of it, but at least we didn't get hung up there and we were able to continue his education on other things beyond what he got stuck on. Yeah. And then he can come take a private to, to learn that one thing. So yeah, I'm all about, you may not be like me. You don't want to, you're not going to come to my house and just hang on my couch and watch TV with me yet. So let's go to a party first to hang out before you just sit on my couch and eat, eat dinner with me. Yeah. Yeah. 100% man. It's yeah. I like that. It's kind of like a, well, I don't know about inviting somebody over to, you know, sit on the couch and watch TV, but dating, you yeah. know, if you're in the dating world, 
You know, you don't want to invite a, a, a man or a woman, whatever your flavor is. Like my suggestion is you want to invite them out for like coffee, something where one, you're not going to spend all day with each other. And two, there's an exit. You can get the fuck out if it's not what you wanted. You know, like you meet somebody you're like, hey, you want to grab a coffee? All right, cool. 15 minutes and you're like, I need to get the fuck out of here. Like, I can't do this. And you're like, oh, well, look at the time. I got to go. It's nice to have coffee with you. You know, like no harm, no foul. Boom, you're out of there. So I, I don't I don't know what that's like because I forgot all about dating when I met my wife. My I, my mind was white. I'm educating you. I'm educating you right now, right? Uh, man, I'm trying to think how long ago this was. Maybe 2019 or something like that. Like, I went on a date and... She asked me what you like, we're having coffee, kind of like, you know, my, my approach to this was we'll have coffee that way. If we're not feeling each other, it's just like, Hey, it was nice to meet you. Peace out. So we're having coffee and she asked me like what I do for a living. And I'm like, well, I, I teach this and I am involved with law enforcement and teaching them. And she's like, Oh, how did you get into that? I'm like, Oh, I was a Marine sniper. And she's like, Oh, did you go to war? I'm like, yeah. And she's like, did you kill people? I'm like, that's kind of a weird question. And she's <laughs> like, how could you do that? I'm like, well, I got to go. So, I don't think this is going to work out. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like imagine being on like a date that you couldn't get out of. You'd be like, oh, fuck. How yeah, did right? I that's, I mean, that's a private class. <laughs> that's a date you're stuck on. <laughs> It's a good call, man. I never even thought of that aspect of it because I love myself. So how could other people oh, not love me? Same. I feel it. Yeah. So, all right. I have a video here. I'm going to throw it up on the screen. We're going to watch this video here really quick. And basically what the video is going to show you is kind of like what I'm talking about with the link to pull, watching the bone support fail. And then we're just going to look at consistency. So it's been a while since we shared the screen, Jeff. Yeah, I'm, let's do that. I'm struggling to, <laughs> to remember how to do this. Uh, here we go. It's right in the middle, isn't it? Yeah. It's, it's, I don't know. All right. Can you see this video? There we go. All right, cool. So now, I'm going to hit play. Can I mute this thing? I think I can mute it. There we go. All right, so you're watching him, okay? He's in his position. He just put the bolt forward. He's on target. Boom, takes the shot. He goes like one mil left. Isn't too bad, right? But watch his elbow. See how yep. his elbow has to break his position every single time? Yep. And if I pause this video right now, look at where his scope is mounted. He's got his rings all the way to the back of the action. And he's also got the scope pretty far back, right? So what I like to look at is where is the back of the scope in relation to the bolt being fully extended? So let me see if I can pull this out here. Uh, press play. Oh, he's not going to open the bolt. Here we go. Here we go. Now I got it. All right. So. He's got the bolt fully extended, right? And it looks like the ocular lens is either even with or past the back of the bolt. So that tells me that we could be looking at a, a chassis right now that is set up too long for this shooter. And he is compensating for that length of pull by moving the scope closer to his face, which, hey, sometimes yep. that's what has to happen, right? But I'm just trying to show you that when your length of pull is too long, ah, here comes that elbow. That elbow is going to pop up off the ground and he's going to break his bone support, right? The other thing I wanted to look at in terms of consistency, let me rewind a little bit here. Takes a shot. He goes left one mil. Okay, elbow breaks contact. He's back on target. Now he's left four mils. Elbow breaks contact. Now he's back on target. Boom, now he goes one mil high. Yeah, that one wasn't too bad. 
So his first shot, one mil left. Not bad. This is a 6.5 PRC, by the way. So it's kind of a, a Magnum 6.5 caliber, right? Yeah. His third shot goes one mil high. And then his second shot was four mils left. So there's a lot of inconsistency with the way that his connection to the butt stock is allowing him to manage recoil. Every shot's different. We didn't see any shot that was the same. And we Perfect. can let the video keep playing out. He's going to get back on target. I kind of cropped it out so you could see. Now, to his defense, he did say that he was going to tighten his connection between him and the rifle to try and manage recoil better. So here he goes. He's on target. Boom. Now he went up and to the right. Now he went right and up. And he should. Oh, no. Okay. He doesn't take a third shot. But you see how he changed the pressure that he applies to the rifle, he kind of tightens up his non-firing hand grip, but just those little things changed his rifle's recoil and his consistency. Drastically. Drastically, right? Yep. So now he's shooting from a tripod, and although I don't really agree with the position that he's in, and we kind of talked about this, I'm going to pause the video, we talked about it on our episode two days ago, where Correct. you're going to shoot from a tripod, what are you doing with that non-firing hand and how's it helping you? What's it doing right now? It's, it's not doing him. anything for him at the moment. Not doing anything, right? So it's a wasted limb. But you can see that shot he just took. Let me jump back here. It's a full-size zipstick. He goes up about two and a half mils, right? Up and left. Now he's on that far target and he goes up and left. So his consistency is there, but his recoil management is completely different from Correct. prone to tripod i would just so while it's fresh this this is about where and this rifle is properly set up for me how far back this is in relation to here's whereas if you looked at where his rifle was set up that was about where the bolt was all the way back. exactly yeah so um it's it's in in the closed position the rear ocular lens was pretty much even with the bolt correct now, i almost willing to bet that you take that action and barrel combo right there with the scope mounted and you put it in your Falcor chassis, which allows you to have the length of pull that you desire, right? You put it in your Falcor chassis, that thing's going to be perfect. You take that thing and you drop it at NDT or you drop it in at J. Allen, and it's not going to be perfect because those length of pulls are so much longer for their shortest length. Correct. So, but uh, one other video that I was going to show you is the video that um, was me teaching Miranda how to set her rifle up. So let me pull that up really quick at the video. Here we are. Don't be talking about my, my wardrobe. You got that? That's my favorite. Yeah, that is, oh, I've seen that. That is fantastic. All right, so this is just me and her going through rifle setup, right? So now I've got her and basically asking her, hey, we need to go set up your link to pull first. And she's like, okay. So talk about uh, eye relief and the process that we're going to go through. Here's the rifle. What is link to pull? It is from the trigger to the butt stock. And now I've got her reaching in there, trying to set it up. So she has a Falcor chassis. It's one of the lightweight versions. Um, but some of the modifications that we made to this platform allows you to get that shorter length of pull, even with their non-competition stocks, right? So now we've got our length of pull. It is actually set up in the correct length. So we're solid, right? Now this is where I have her get behind the rifle. And what I'm asking her to do is kind of crawl into the position, but don't mess with the rifle yet. I don't care about you putting the rifle on your shoulder. What I care about is just like we talked about, here is her, you know, get your elbows wide, support your face with your, with your knuckles or your hands. And this is the position that she's going to be comfortable in. So now once we've established where her comfortable height level is for her face and her chest and her shoulders, now we can extend bipods, which is what I'm going to do, and get her position. 
and you can see she's running Atlas bipods up there, right? But they're mm -hmm. not in the lowest configuration. We've got them pulled out like two notches. And now we start getting rid of the cheek piece. Remember, the cheek piece comes at the end. It's last. And now I'm showing her where she should feel the buttstock. And for me, I like that the top probably half inch of the buttstock doesn't touch my body at all. That's how I know that I have it high enough. And also telling her, I want you to feel where your jawline is with that stock so that your head will just drop onto the cheek piece, onto the chassis, and now you're looking through the scope, right? So the scope is crooked. It's not even in the rings properly right now, which doesn't matter to me. I want to get her set up in the right position. And now we can start playing with where should the scope be mounted? So here we are. We got her in the right position. Hey, let me give you this rear bag. I want you to put that underneath the buttstock. And it's a piece of support gear. It is not doing everything for you. It is enhancing what you've already built, right? So here she is. Doesn't look bad, right? She got a good position. Now she's starting to understand how to use the rear bag. And now I can start moving the scope to get her where she needs to be. Oh. But does that make sense in terms of what we talked about? It does. And that's that's the perfect order of operations. <clears throat> um, I really liked the one of the real things I really like about the Falcor chassis is the adjust the easy adjustability in the um buttstock placement and the cheek piece yeah um for me those are you know besides length of pull but the the, the buttstock placement and cheek piece for me are important because there's a lot of rifles i can't get behind just because of my cheekbones yeah 100 percent, man so that is today's episode just talking about building your rifle to fit you as an individual right and there's other little nuances that i could go into like uh you know i've seen rifle manufacturers that have two big cheek pieces so what it causes you to do is have your head fucking sideways and I don't like it. Yep. So I've seen people move their cheek piece out of the way and it's like, okay, but that's only going to help you shoot right-handed. What if you have to shoot left-handed? Now you're fucked, you know? And same thing, like you'll see people, um, I call it cheating where they'll take their butt pad and they'll, some, some butt pads have the ability to raise and you can adjust them. Not only can you raise them, but you can also tilt them to fit yeah. the angle of your, your upper chest. And it's like, okay, stop. One, are you raising the butt, you know, the butt pad because you're compensating for a shitty position? Why can't you just build a better position? Why do you have to raise the butt pad? And then two, if you're rotating the pad left or right, then what are you doing that you couldn't do by changing your position. You know, like I like that gear has the ability to make adjustments, but I don't like using those adjustments to compensate for shitty positions or bad, you know, bad fundamentals. Right. So keep that in mind when you're building your gun to use them as an enhancement, not as a crutch. But and don't forget, we still have to, we still owe each other videos too of, I was, just gonna ask you, I was gonna ask you, have you made your video on no? I'm I'm gonna make it tomorrow. Tomorrow's my free day. So okay. Okay. Well I'll then make my video tomorrow. I'm thinking on our Tuesday podcast, we will have to show those videos and compare. You know it's gonna be a competition, right? Everything. Everything will be a competition. Who had the better position? Who had the better video? Like it's fucking and don't be bringing in your fucking video editing buddy to help you either. <laughs> that would be cheating. Son of a bitch. All right, brother. All right, man. Well, enjoy your Sunday or sorry, your set the rest Saturday of Saturday for me. Yeah. Yeah. Enjoy the rest of your Saturday. And we'll get back at this in a couple of days. The rest of you, if you guys need anything, message us, hit us up. You got questions about setting up your rifle, or you just want us to look at something. We're available anytime. It might not be instantly, but I'll do my best. Jeff, appreciate you, buddy. Enjoy the rest of your day. I'll talk to you later.